Welcome everyone to Lunch with Lori, where I schedule time with leaders in our industry to hear how they're navigating their career and learn about their perspectives on leadership and current world issues. And our goal is to expand your perspectives. Now today, my guest is Peter and nice to see you. And I am so pleased to speak with him today. We've posted Peter's bio and I encourage you to read about the many accomplishments um, that Peter has had. He's an amazing leader, but I'm just gonna focus on a couple of things to get us started um, and to, to give you a taste of this amazing person. So Peter currently sits on the executive management team of Lundbeck as a VP for North America. He oversees the operation of both the US and Canadian businesses. He began his career in pharma at Eli Lilly before moving on to senior positions at BMS and Neuronetics. He holds a bachelor's in economics and management and an MBA and sits on the board of pharma. So importantly, Paige received the HBA Honorable Mentor Award in 2019, and I had the opportunity to meet his beautiful family who adore him. So welcome, Paige. Thank you, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And let me say congratulations to you on your announced upcoming, uh, I guess, retirement. But I, I th if I know you well, I don't think you really will be retired. I think you'll be extremely active and I can't wait to see what your next chapter looks like. And I certainly wish you all the best in your next chapter. Well, thank you, Peter. I am wondering what I'm going to do to fill my time. Um, so you, you nailed it. Thank you. <laughs> you know me well. Um, and since many people who will listen to this over our lunch break, one of the things I know about you is you hail from Greek roots. So what would be a typical favorite you'd have on the lunch menu? Well, I have a lot of favorites, but in, in watching calories and trying to eat healthy, of course, I would have a Greek salad, no onions with chicken on top. But if I wasn't watching my calories, I would have my absolute favorite a Greek dish, which is called pastizo, which is like a Greek lasagna. Oh. A little carb heavy though for lunch. Oh, I, <laughs> that sounds delicious. And of course, baklava for uh, dessert is just. Yeah, then then we're completely blowing the diet. Then, <laughs> then it's all bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, patient, one of the things I ask um, uh, guests having lunch with me um, is about their career trajectory and sort of how they manage it. So you're on the executive management team at Lundbeck. Um, and I wonder how you approached and, and sort of navigated that career path. So was it on one end of the spectrum, very planned and intentional? Or are you kind of on the other end of the spectrum where it's spontaneous and something's of interest? And so, you, you know, you seize the opportunity. Where in that spectrum do you lie? I think somewhere in the middle. So uh, a directional roadmap with a few scenic diversions is the way <laughs> I would uh, I would describe it. So uh, definitely had goals set in mind and, and pursued mostly a linear path. But some opportunities came up that at first, to be quite honest, uh, I didn't see the value because they were side uh, movements that I felt were uh, sideways movements versus advanced movements. But I got to tell you, every time I was willing to do that, and I can count at least three times that I did that, where I took a lateral move, I think it propelled me two or three steps uh, forward. And I'm really thankful for those lateral moves. And I encourage everyone not just to always be thinking about their career in a linear progression, because there's a lot to be learned from those other opportunities and broadening your horizons and broadening your scope. I'm, I'm very thankful for those opportunities. Mm, bravo. And was that someone who saw something in you and said, hey, there's this opportunity and kind of they knew you could do it? Is that was it sort of that sponsor tap on the shoulder for those? Well, you know, uh, certainly, I've had plenty of those, uh, but it, you know what? Those side movements, at first, I was a bit resistant to because I didn't think they were advancing my career. So my mentors basically helped me understand that, no, if you think about it a bit more holistically, yes, it may seem like it's a sideways move, but if you learn this extra skill or get this mm -hmm. other experience, it'll set you up more uh uh, more appropriately, or maybe to give you a chance to more aggressively advance your career. And I'm thankful for that mentoring guidance that I received uh, because it, it was true. It did help. Yeah. So that's the great piece about mentors and sponsors. They see 
a bigger picture that sometimes we can't see for ourselves. So you were, that was a really fortunate. And um, now, one of the things, um, a, as you talked about in the beginning, as I step away from the CEO role, I started to become very reflective right about the changes that that I've seen over the past 15 years regarding you know yeah. gender parity and equity and wonder what are some of the changes you've noticed over the past year yeah i mean I, well over my career it, you know it went from being a boys club which even as a boy i didn't necessarily want to participate in i thought it was exclusive and sometimes that club didn't even match you know the way i thought about things uh, Largely, I've seen that almost completely eradicated. I've seen, you know, women uh, be the dominant uh, gender in our workforce in in uh, healthcare, uh, and occupying, rightly so, equal numbers of middle management and senior management roles. I think we still have work to do in the C-suite and in the boardroom. But from where uh, we were when I first entered the industry to where we are now is a huge advancement. And we still have a little ways to go, uh, but we make such progress. And and I'll actually turn around and ask you in your uh, reflections, uh, especially in your role in in um, HBA, what kind of changes have you seen, and are you most proud of? Oh wow! So probably when I first started, um, I would call it gender parity was sort of a, a window dressing, right? It was it was the box was ticked. It was championed by people who largely took to it from a moral angle. Um, but we then moved into having a business case for gender parity. And I think it, businesses then realize, hey, this is good for business. And so that really started to have some pressure in a good way on the HBA to pump up the talent pipeline, which, which we did. But then the needle didn't move. Right. Um, so we were like, what what's going on here? We have all these leader ready women. And what we started to recognize was this this feeling that we are trying to fix women to get into this model of what a leader looks like, which all too often is you know, a, a male uh, model in people's minds. So women candidates were there, but it, they were seen as taking a risk. The meaning the the people hiring the woman seemed like it was a risk versus you know competing on even ground. So that's when we started to work with companies to say, do you know there are some things going on that are systemic issues. So when we started to do that and, and help organizations to see that women leaders are ready and it isn't a risk. Any candidate is a risk. They're not going to be because of their gender be a greater risk. And I think much of that was about male allies who helped us advocate for that change. And now I think while women are um, at parity in many companies at, at many different levels, the issue now is about equity for mm -hmm. women, right? Especially women of color because they are disproportionately underrepresented. So yes. talking about men as allies, and you were the 2019 honorable mentor, and you had a front row seat um, into talking to other men and, and men helping contribute to the progress we've seen. So what is it that you recommend to men as, as a way to advance and be more inclusive so that that gender equitable leadership role can, you know, really come to the top? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to answer that. But let me say something a bit provocative for a second. And that is I'm starting to think that the term ally in the concept of gender equity is no longer applicable. It used to be applicable uh, in the early days in, in what you describe. But mm -hmm. to me, ally implies a small group of people that are enlightened, that are mm -hmm. doing things uh, to help women. To be honest, I don't think that should be a small group or an enlightened group. That should be the way we work. And I think in a lot of cases, it is the way we work. And I think to me, it's an expectation at this point where maybe in the 90s, it might have been a small group. Now it's an expectation. And quite frankly, I would turn it on its head and say that anybody who's not acting that way needs to be called out and not necessarily putting the quote unquote allies on a pedestal, because to me, that is expected behavior at this point. 
Um, so anyway, uh, to answer your specific question, I think we as um, uh, as folks who are advocates, men who are advocates for gender parity, I think need to be proactive and not just reactive and identify those talented women in our organization and tap them on the shoulder uh, mm -hmm. for discussions, business discussions, get to know them better, hear their insights. Uh, and those business discussions can sometimes turn into a mentoring protege relationship. And then that mentoring protege relationship can turn into a sponsorship relationship. And then uh, those uh, talented women uh, can rightly uh, take the spots that they deserve uh, based on their talents and experiences. So I think men need to be uh, proactive. And the other thing I think uh, men need to do is is make sure to to kind of push and encourage uh, those women to achieve the the types of roles that they can. And I don't think that we always need to have um, to hold back or have kind of kid gloves. I mean, let's have a genuine, honest relationship in the same way we might with a male colleague, with a female colleague, and that will, I think, set them up and give them the best chance uh, to achieve uh, what their talents and experiences uh, would dictate that they achieve. Totally agree, and you and I have had this conversation before about when you think about your mentoring relationships, what kind of conversations are you having you know, with a, with a woman and a man, and are, are they similar? Um, because some of the research shows that men can have the kid gloves on, and they don't really give the kind of feedback that could be very helpful to someone's career. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think we're doing uh, our, our uh, uh, talented women a favor by holding back. Uh, I think we need to, to, to treat them in the exact same way we treat men and give them those same opportunities, of course. Yeah, agreed, agreed. It gets to the equity. Um, so so if, if you are provocative, how about I, I'm provocative back a, as well? Because um, when, when we had um, Rod McKenzie on stage this year at Woji, one of the things that he had said is, he thought there was gender parity. He truly thought, he looked around, he saw women, he saw women at, at different levels and, and it hadn't really sort of, you know, registered to him that there, the experience, the life experience a woman had was not the same as, as that of, of a man. And he mm -hmm. encouraged the audience to really talk what you just said about the having the conversations, you're really, lining up beautifully with what he said. But I think the piece I would add is men really do have to stop for a minute and think about whether or not there really is gender parity around them. You know, do, do the math, do some counting, yeah. make sure your company is doing the counting. Yeah, I completely agree. I, first of all, uh, Rod uh, did a great job, but so did everybody. Uh, and that was a wonderful event uh, that was quite inspiring, uh, just like the face-to-face -face events uh, have been. So kudos to you. But yeah, I agree with, with Rod. I, I, I've seen tremendous growth. And like I said, in many levels of organizations, it, it, there is uh, largely parity, at least among positions, but not necessarily about experiences. Uh, and I think that's the point Rod made that you're uh, emphasizing, which I totally agree with. And of course, we need to do more with women of color, as you point out, and of course, uh, C-suite, boards. Uh, so, but, but I am so encouraged by the progress. I know there's work to do, but I'm a positive person in general, and I have to emphasize the progress and, and how the complexion of this industry looks very different than it did just a few years ago. It, we're really seeing, I mean, I, I agree with you. We are seeing the results, especially in our collaborative. Um, the numbers of the companies who are in the collaborative where we are actively engaging to change the systemic um, uh, uh, barriers that are holding them back is working. What we have to now work on is that equity. So when we, when we look at women, um, is it white women? that are progressing or, or is it all women? And that's where I think we can do some work. And I think the thing I would um, ask men to do is not only be more aware, ask questions, but also when they hear something going on, you know, people call it a microaggression um, or bias at play, that they don't leave it to the person who's experiencing the bias to speak up you know, on their own behalf, but 
to voice that you're not comfortable um, with mm -hmm. what you just heard. And that is so helpful to the person, you know, so that that is experiencing not feeling they truly belong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, question for you, because I know your boss, um, who is the amazing Deborah Dunsire, um, and um, talking about companies being ready to welcome people back. Um, I think on the US side of the pond um, versus uh, where Lundbeck is headquartered, that concept of future of work um, is, is looking a bit different in, in Europe versus um, the US. So in that concept of the um, how we go back to work, and one of the things that a lot of the data are showing us is that women are disproportionately been impacted by the pandemic. And um, when they do come back, are they choosing to work from home? Some people are pulling back, some are even leaving. So what is Lundbeck doing to you know, bring everyone back to work? And if there are differences between the US and, and Europe, would love to hear that. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, it's sad, but it is a true statement that uh, this pandemic has disproportionately affected women. I, mm -hmm. I was hoping that our industry would be uh, less affected or that it wouldn't be true for our company, but it is true. And so when we think about uh, future of work, we have to balance, I think, a couple of things. That's what we're wrestling with, and I'm sure every company is. And that is that being face-to-face -face in a complex industry like ours that requires innovation, that requires challenging each other, that requires cross-functional work, is best done face-to-face. -face. Having said that, it doesn't need to exclusively be done face-to-face. -face. And, and then we also do have to think about our employees uh, certainly to help our uh, female employees where there's a disproportionate burden of family care, child care, et cetera, and with schools having been closed, et cetera, mm -hmm. everything that you and the audience knows very well is something we have to challenge. But I think for other people too, for all employees, we're willing to enter a level of flexibility that we never had before and certainly not go back to the pre-pandemic way. So to be specific, we've announced, so our office has been open actually since last June because we also wanted to, but on a voluntary basis. Uh, so we wanted to give people who needed a place to get out of the home, to get away from their kids, to be able to have a place to concentrate, mm -hmm. to be able to go to. So that's been there as an option. We have announced that uh, we'll be returning fully uh, after Labor Day. And we pick that because it gives people plenty of advance notice. Hopefully schools will be uh, back in. Child care will be back uh, available. Uh, but we also have announced that we're not going to go back to the traditional, you know, five day a week, eight to five or whatever work um, environment. And so I think trying to strike that balance between being face to face uh, much of the time so that we can get that innovation, so we can get that collaboration, uh, but at the same time, offer people flexibility to help meet their personal needs is what we're striving for. That is, I, I love that. Um, especially when you were talking about having people come back that needed to come back, right? There's some people that they really needed to come back to the office and there's other people that that wasn't the right thing for them. So. That's a, and even a, when they came back, they didn't come back every day. They might come one day a week and yeah. just say, okay, look, I need like one day of concentration time to crank things out or catch up or whatever. So we wanted to accommodate it when it was safe and when it was allowed mm -hmm. by local laws um, to give people multiple options. Sounds like you've got that nailed. Well, we still have a lot of details to work out. Nailed is probably a premature statement, but uh, I think philosophically we know where we want to be now. We have to execute it. Makes sense. Makes total sense. So what, what, do you have any thoughts? Actually, I, I love you pick your brain. Do you have any advice on the future of work and you know perspectives from the HBA or what you've heard across the industry since you have that broad lens? Well, did you, I think what you were doing, you're probably, um, you went back uh, many of the companies that we're talking to haven't gone back at all. So I think you've opened up an, a, an earlier window to help meet the, those differing needs. But um, the collaborative I mentioned earlier, this is a top priority for them. So we're doing a lot of talking about this and and really they, they do not want to lose the workforce. They've done such great work to get women you know, at all levels and we want yeah. to make sure that 
we don't um, uh, fall back. There are some stats that say this could set women back 25 years in terms of the numbers. So this is really important stuff. So this is something that is is on our radar screen. So one of the things that um, is an example of how we're making sure companies are thinking about this. So if a woman decides to work from home and it's great that the company is enabling that, but the male colleague is returning to the office, let's say it's performance evaluation time. How does the boss evaluate someone, you know, on equal footing when they're right there in front of them and someone, you know, who is is working from home and are they, you know, maybe an expanded role comes up or even a brand new role. Is it, it's just your top of mind, the recency factor, right? To have yeah. the, the man who's in front. So I don't know if that's coming up for for you all and, and trying to what might be different in this more flexible arrangement that might not work in favor of a woman if she decides to stay yeah, yeah. working from home. You bring up great points, and those are the types of details yeah. that uh, we yeah. we also still need to work out. And that's why you know your declaration of success. Uh, I, I'm not there yet to 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 wave the flag that we figured it out because those exactly what you described and other challenges are ones that are way heavy on our minds uh, to make sure that we're not giving up the great progress that we made. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, excellent points and one that we're very uh, ones that we're very mindful of try to navigate but it's the the good part is that you are talking about it it's on your radar screen you're seeing the data you want to take action you're being flexible and now you're trying to proactively get to those and and that's all we can ask because none of us have seen this before there is no roadmap there's no book we can go look up to see you know what what have others done in the past we are navigating new territory. So I can tell you Lundbeck is very, um, I, I would say lucky to have you on their team because you do think about things like this. And whether it's your background, having, you know, having daughters and, you know, it is you, like it exudes from your pores. You care about this. Well, thank you. Yeah, I definitely care. And, and and I think we've made a lot of progress as an industry. There's a lot of people out there that do care. We just need to all continue to stay focused and vigilant and not take for granted uh, the significant progress. Good point. Good point. Thank you so much for spending your lunch break with me, Peter. That was such a like heartwarming soup for the soul. Yeah, and, and for me as well, and let me just say one more time, thank you for everything you've done. I mean, a lot of the games that we just talked about, you have been a leader in, and you will be greatly missed. We'll certainly embrace your successor. Uh, they'll have big shoes to fill, uh, but you've done an excellent job, and I've really enjoyed getting to know you, and I hope that our relationship maintains in your next chapter. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Take care, Lori. Thank you. And please join me next month when I will be chatting with another incredible industry leader like Peja that I know you'll learn much from. And it will be my last lunch with Laurie. I look forward to it. Um, and this has been Lunch with Laurie. I hope it was nourishment that refueled your leadership tank. Until next time, bon appetit.